So this is what we just started, I'm saying just in the last, say, six months. We've embarked on this long-term mission, and I think it fits quite well into this general notion that we need to monitor. I think a lot of organizations that are represented here have that mandate. I'd like to bring attention to Natalie. She's actually the person that initiated this program. She's an ecological coordinator of Cape Nature Garden Route. Um, and this is very much a Cape Nature driven process. I'm just an advisor and I've helped them get it off the ground and I'll be there hopefully in long term to keep it going and to motivate. But it's really driven by Cape Nature and run by Cape Nature field rangers. She coordinates them. So, yeah, why monitor? Well, again, I think I was here last year when I just started this job and it was just after there was this horrible experience we, we had the seven days into my new job um, as coastal ecologist at DIA, when we had the stranding of the Kianusatu at in an MPA, right there. We were sitting there for, I think, 12 days, um, and then there was an oil spill. Luckily, not a major extent oil, oil spill in retrospect. We have been monitoring the, the recovery. Um, but yeah, it was still a shock to the system. So what happened then is there, were, there was a lack of baselines in the intertidal areas and they are mostly affected by oil because oil is on the surface of the ocean mostly and then it clumps up and moves down. They had very good baseline data for reefs but not for intertidal. At basically zero notice, um, the manager of Hokama called in his buddies from Anchor Environmental and said, come right now, it was a long week weekend, and do a baseline survey of sandy beaches and rocky shores, right now. <laughs> they did. Within hours, they left Cape Town and drove to Kokama. They surveyed beaches and rocky shores, managed to survey um, four sites of each before the oil came onto the shore. So that was our saving grace, because now we had baselines to compare an impact to. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any um, reference in terms of biodiversity. So it was a wake-up call, as it says here. There are lots of MPAs that do not have baseline data for um, intertidal or subtidal systems. Sorry, MPAs, marine protected areas for those who are not marine people. Um, so, um, yeah, here it's written out. We need those baseline data, data to assess impacts of pollution, to find whether alien, aliens invade. So this ship was sitting there on a reef. The hull of the ship was probably fouled. With, um, it came from the east, I think from um, Taiwan, am I, am I not mistaken? Um, it was carrying rice. Um, so just sitting there for 12 days would be enough time for um, a hitchhiker to jump off and invade our shores. We have lots of examples in the intertidal, being, the intertidal zone being completely invaded. Almost 80% of the area being um, dominated by alien invasives. So very serious problem. Then, obviously, there are other climate change-related issues that we want to pick up, like sea level rise. Is there sea level rise? Um, and changes in water temperature due to global warming. That's long-term goals. So, yeah, basically, um, this is what Natalie addressed me with, saying, we want to know these things, can you help? We don't have the skills, it's not our background. So here I was, finally I can do something <laughs> in the chaos of deer. So, um, yeah, here we went and we sat down. No, then I decided, okay, let's for now not do sandy beaches, but focus on rocky shores. Why rocky shores? Well, um, firstly, it's much easier to score the data of rocky shores um, if it's a, it's a um, monitoring program driven by the field rangers who are not experts in taxonomy and not, um, well, not really skilled with the microscope. Rocky shore organisms you can identify with the bare eyes and that's an advantage. At the same time, rocky shores are proper complex marine systems, but they're accessible from land during low tide, especially spring low tide. So, and that makes them, on one hand, very um, useful for research purposes. A lot of the fundamental ecological principles were established on rocky shores, keystone species principles, top-down and bottom-up effects on communities, all these big ecological buzzwords. So it's a perfect laboratory. On the other hand, obviously it's also accessible 
to poaching, to all sorts of human pressures. So, um, well, recently we also we have a lot of interns at DEER that need training, and a lot of them cannot swim. It's a reality for South Africa. People are not trained to swim. It's also something side of that we need to change. But um, at the same time, it really um, prevents them from getting involved into dive surveys or any other marine sort of projects. And I thought, well, rocky shores are really ideal to get people involved, hands-on involved in the marine environment, develop that intimacy that you need to keep your passion going, to keep conservation going. So I'm all for focusing on rocky shores. Sandy beaches, equally important, but much more difficult. So here for those who are not marine people, or haven't been, and there are lots of people that haven't been to the rocky shores, people have taken to the rocky shores that never have seen this natural beauty. I mean, there is definitely a lot of that, and a lot of these species, like we just heard in the previous talk, um, are very important, have important functions for ecosystems, starting from carbon sequestration to providing habitats for other organisms. So, um, here just a few, um, mainly to show color and diversity, and also different forms of life. So we have coralline algae, for example, are primary producers. They are pink, but they still have pigments to fix carbon dioxide. A lot of people wouldn't think of that. And then we have grazers and filter feeders. So lots of different functional groups represented on the rocky shores. There's a crab, there's a predator. Barnacles are filter feeders, so they tie organic matter to the substrate. Okay, so what are our goals for this monitoring program? Okay, I already talked in length about baselines. We need them. We also want to know about scales of very natural variability. So if you don't monitor regularly, you may monitor at a diversity peak or a trough, and you're not even aware you are where you are in time. So regular data collection is necessary to establish these scales of variability. Are there seasonal changes, interannual changes? Does El Nino play a role, or the Benguela Nino? Um, in other countries where they have these long-term monitoring programs for the last 20 or 30 years, that's mainly the US and parts of Europe, they have picked up the scale, scale variation through these rocky shore monitoring programs. Separate human from human induced from natural sort of variability, that's one of our goals. Also identify shifts in zonation patterns due to sea level rise identify range expansions, like we're experiencing a lot in the Western Cape now. Everything seems to be moving, cold water species moving from west to east, warm water species retracting towards the east to, due to changes in wind field and global climate change in the end. Um, monitor long-term changes in oceanographic regimes and provide a context for more detailed studies. So, what do we have to consider? That's for all monitoring programs, you have to always be specific of your goals because the way you set up will limit of what you can get out of it. So, I've given you the goals previously. So, it must be very well designed. Everybody must stick to the rules to be able to, the rules meaning the methods of the monitoring programs to get the most out of this. It needs to be simple, simple enough to maintain, cost efficient, logistically doable. Well, and then I have this thing about ownership. I don't believe that top-down programs work very well. And um, I think that, well, we need to listen to the people on the ground. What are the needs? What are the skills? And how are they going to take it on? And that's what I think we achieved so far in this program. We don't have data yet. Though. <laughs> and yes, we need to build capacity to keep it going in future. So how did we set up this monitoring program? You see here, Ah, there is a pointer. Um, this is the shore, the rocks, the sea is here, the land is here. And we decided to go for three transects. This is the high water mark, there would be the low water mark. In the intertidal, this zone is dry. So you can walk here, three transects, and we decided to go with the photographic method. Now there are lots of disadvantages about this method, because you see here on this photograph, you're missing a lot of Creatures, we just heard in the previous talk how many organisms live in seaweed and under seaweed. You don't see them with the photographic method, with this method alone. Um, however, you have a record that you can keep forever if you store it well, and you can show it to people that are non-biologists, and it's quite an obvious way to show it change. Um, and you can analyze a photograph in many different ways. 
Plus, mainly, it's very quick to take it to it. In a couple of hours, two people can survey an entire shore with a photo method. If you would do it properly, I say properly, i.e. with a quadrant scoring all biodiversity, you would take a team of people of 10 people um, for an entire, could be two or three days when, uh, during the spring tide. So it's, it's really much quicker and therefore maybe the only thing that's doable at this scale in the MPAs at the moment. Um, so then we decided to go for four times a year. That also was decided by the managers. That's as much as can be done. Um, and yeah, and it will be supplemented with belt transect where transects, which is basically just a line, and then you scan a belt left and right for particular species of interest. So in the, those areas that we started, for karma, oysters are very important. So you really look in the crevices where the oysters live, you, you tackle different um, species of interest. The, the, um, in the hoop, it's giant periwinkles and abalones that are very important. I'm sure every, every MPA has their own target species that are interesting. Then in gray here, I have put temperature loggers. I've ordered them, and they're not installed at this stage, but we wanted to put temperature logger at every site, at least at every MPA, in the intertidal. I know there are some offshore, but how much does that signal of offshore oceanography actually translate into the intertidal? Um, and fixed point photography, because sand is a big, important driver, and just at these sites, at least, we can have a record of sand moving in and out. That also came from the managers. All these objective, objectives were actually from the, like, given by the reserve managers, and we just translated it into something doable. So this is, these are the photographs of the first setup. We selected sites here. The site on Robert Peninsula. It's a beautiful place to work. Well, we mainly, when we, you select a site, you look for a platform where you can get from the lowest intertidal level. Sorry, I just skimmed over that previously. There's, there's zonation on rocky shores, so you have different organisms living lower on the shore than higher on the shore because the higher shore organisms have to be adapted to being exposed to sun and elements, and terrestrial elements, much more than the lower shore individuals. So um, you have this gradient. So you, we wanted to have organisms all along. Not every rocky shore does that. <laughs> I know it's what's written in the textbook, book, but it was, we had to walk around quite a lot to find a good site where you don't have big trenches and pools and things like that. Because I uh, previously uh, I didn't mention, we tried to avoid those. They're very interesting, microhabitats, very species diverse, especially cracks, pools, but not very comparable. So we went for open rock platforms that are drained, and because that's what's, firstly it's done everywhere, so you can compare um, with other programs, but also it's a more practical for, the photo, for a photographic approach. Here we drill, you can't see, but I'm holding a drill, it's one of my favorite activities. And they're the Cape Nature guys from Robo. And I say, guys, it's a, all the field rangers came, um, although it was a weekend, it was their spare time, so they're really keen. Um, here's the Hokama field ranger, also extremely keen people. It was a real pleasure to work with them. Um, and then I'm showing them how to, well, actually, we didn't have a quadrant, but we had, more, we had time left, so we said, okay, let's just pretend we have a quadrant, and I'll show you how to do the survey. And we did a baseline survey. Here they, they're now doing the photographs themselves. I mean, it's not rocket science. You try to get a 30 by 30 square and take a picture. Make sure that there's a scale on it. Um, okay, now, we, the processing of the data is also being done by the field rangers. Again, they're very keen. We will see how it goes. But um, at this stage, we're going to train them on how to do it because they want to see data. They're not interested in getting involved, spending another a bit of their time that's already full on another project where they don't see results. They want to see results, and it came through so clearly. And some of the field rangers have a real neck for sitting by the computer and analyzing. One minute. Okay. So they're going to score percent cover of organisms and count mobile species. That can be put straight into Excel sheets and databases using this software called Coral Point Count. Oh, I would love to talk about this, but there's no time. So we're not going to species level. We're going to functional group level because there's so much error introduced by misidentifications of species. So we're just skimming over functional groups, but what is a functional group? And yes, I can give a whole lecture about that, but not now. So we, we, would decide, we decided to go with the combination of the first three types of functional groups. Scoring, like habitat-forming species, like different mussels, including aliens, and there we would distinguish between different species, 
trophic groups, like primary producers versus predators versus filter feeders, and some taxonomic grouping, red algae versus green algae versus brown algae. So that's custom made for our needs, functional groups. Then data storage challenges, I'm very happy to skip this because we haven't solved them yet. Big amounts of data at this stage we're using Dropbox and Google um, documents, but that's going to not be enough. But we have a whole group at DIA that, that works with those and I'm going to meet with them and hopefully there's a solution. I'm running a workshop if anyone's keen to come or knows field rangers, wants to send them um, on how to get from the photograph through identifying species and assigning functional groups, putting it into the software, and then generating the kind of graphs that you want. She says, stop. <laughs> well, the way forward is to analyze the data after a year. I'm almost stopping. And then to expand to other MPAs, hopefully, which is why I'm here. This is a promotion call. And then also to supplement those course data we're generating with, this, with proper <laughs> in-depth, detailed biodiversity surveys, which can only be done at a lower frequency than this. And then we see how well this monitoring program works in, in reflecting actual biodiversity and community structure. So this is the, the proper scientific approach. Sorry, I'm going, the other one is just coarse. Okay, so ignore all the talk, but please join in. We can only do this if we join efforts. I'm happy to advise and, and you know, assist, but it really needs to be driven bottom-up by the MPA staff. Thank you. Thank you